Hello, church. We are here in part four of the strange and wonderful world of Scripture. And if you've been listening to the last three Sundays, then you've been discomforted and you've also been made more comfortable and you've had some anxieties put into your life and you've had some taken out of your life. This is called a deconstruction period, but it won't last long. We will build back up because that's the whole point is to make sure that we're believing in what we're supposed to believe in and that we understand what our Bibles are, how they were written, and how we should work with them. We've talked about how our scripture has humanity written all over it and how God has gently broken into our story to lead us more and more toward who he really is. And it does seem like on that trip from where we were to where Jesus wants us, has been a rough one where we've hit every single possible pothole along the way. But we need to look. So let's continue to look at how God takes us from what we think about him to what he really is and who he really is. Jonah is a good place to see this in action. I love the book of Jonah. And no, I don't wrestle around at night trying to figure out whether it was a whale or another creature and how you know to swallow a human I don't because that's not the point of the story at all we tend to get distracted by these things God sends a prophet a prophet of God named Jonah to the Gentiles that the Jews of that day thought were the worst Gentiles of all the Gentiles out there you see there's the shocker that we don't get we just go okay he sent them to the Gen no the Jews reading this, the first readers of it would have gone, what? Our God would never do such a thing. Why would he send Jonah to, to the Gentiles? You see, the Jews had never been told to be evangelistic. They were not evangelistic. And Jewish people to this day, whether they're Reformed, modern, uh, uh, Orthodox, conservative, they are not evangelistic. That is not a part of who they are. And so this concept already has shocked us. Throughout the book, the only people who call on God, who ask God for direction, for wisdom, for help, and for forgiveness are the pagans. They're the only ones. The Jew in this story, which is Jonah, is he didn't call upon God for any of these things. He runs from God. He ignores the fact that there is God. He watches the pagans call out to all the false gods without bringing up, well, okay. It took him a long time to bring up, well, there is one and I'm running from him. And he says, just throw me overboard and that'll solve your problem. And the pagans are the ones showing mercy saying, no, we can't throw you overboard. That would be wrong. <laughs> it is, it's amazing. They showed mercy. Jonah did not. So whenever he walks into Nineveh as a representative of the one true God, he preaches the world's shortest sermon. 40 days and Nineveh shall fall. That's it. That's all we have of the sermon. And the Ninevites, to the shock of Jonah, listen to him and go, oh no, we don't want that to happen. What can we do about it? Jonah doesn't give him any direction at all because he didn't care. And the Ninevites then start praying and repenting. And God calls Jonah back over and goes, you know, I'm not going to destroy him after all. Do you understand what we've already seen in this book? God is destroying the religious presumptions and foundation of Jonah by sending him to talk to the Ninevites and tell them to repent. He doesn't want to do that. That just completely shatters everything he thought about God. But he goes in. And he says his little sermon with zero hope that these people will survive. In fact, with no desire that they are saved. He wants them to be destroyed. We know that because when God comes back to him and goes, you know, they're so sorry. I'm not going to destroy them. Jonah gets angry. He goes, I just knew you were like this. He actually does. Read the book of Jonah. I just knew you were like this. Always forgiving people. And he gets upset. Goes, sits outside the camp. 
sits under a little gourd. Evidently, he had a you know, bald head and, and such. And so he wanted to get out from under the sun. Who, who could blame him? The gourd, God sends a worm to kill the gourd. And all of a sudden, he, he doesn't have his foliage anymore. And he starts getting angry again. And God goes, you have more care and interest in the survival of that vine than you did of all these people. And then God even goes, hey, and they've got lots of cows too. It's just like, if you don't like the people, how about the animals? Do you care about the animals? It is fascinating. By the way, the Jews have incorporated this story into their, their holidays. One of the holidays in particular, they read this book. And then the reader of the book after silence says, I am Jonah. It's a way for all of them. And then they repeat, I am Jonah. To, to remember that God loves even those people we say he wouldn't ever love and who we say he was planning to destroy. Think about that. Once again, our community story gets a hard corrective when God enters it. God tried to bring him gently along, but Jonah didn't want to come. What about you? Are you willing to be led gently forward and start reading, for example, all the way back to Genesis 12, where God already was telling us his intention is to save everybody. In Genesis 12, starting at verse 1, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. <coughs> Excuse me. Here goes the poetic blessing. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples. I, I don't know how much plainer he could say what his intentions are. But he says them again and again in Isaiah, for example. And I'm just cherry picking here. There are scores and scores of these all through the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6, he says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. You got my attention. Whenever he looks and he goes, it's too small a thing to restore Judah and Israel, my peoples and my tribes. He goes further. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. That's God. That's his intention. When God protects his people throughout the Old Testament, we often make the mistake of thinking he didn't love the others as much as he loved Israel. Yet as the angels declared at his birth, his love is for all of us it is for all of us. It will never be in doubt. Was, is, and never be in doubt. He loves us. Another great story in the Old Testament to try to illustrate the love of God is one of my favorite books, and that is the book of Hosea. Hosea does not come off looking good here, but I'm going to cut him a little bit of slack in that I don't know much about him. I didn't have lunch with him. I'm not hung out with him. But also God ruined his life. Hosea, once again, a priest. A priest, a prophet of God. The Old Testament is very, very clear. A priest cannot marry a woman accused of adultery. Certainly not one which is active in adultery. And yet God orders him to do so. Now many scholars believe the adultery did not start until after the marriage. But regardless... God has ruined his life by saying, marry that woman. Well, after the marriage is, uh, is made, it's very obvious it's a very bad one. And because we've already done a lesson on Hosea some time back, I won't go into a lot of detail here. I'll just say that when the boys are born, he names them. This is tragedy. That one's not mine. I mean, this, uh, that's the way he names them. It, were they all you know, created by another guy or a series of guys, very possibly. But regardless, this is the life <laughs> that Hosea has. I often wonder if his wife was driven to some of this because of 
Hosea being a mean guy. We don't know. We don't know. We have no basis to judge either side here because that's not the point. This isn't a soap opera unfolding so we can pick sides. What the point is, is what happens next. She leaves. Whether he puts her away or she just runs away and she becomes a sex worker or something similar just to survive. The next time we see her, she is standing on a slave auction block being auctioned off at the absolute lowest price of, that a slave could be sold for. Uh, she has fallen so far, it's almost like they got to beg people to pay a little bit just to take her. And God says to Hosea, go pay for her. And then, he doesn't say, you own her, correct her. Or, no. He says, you woo her back. Take her on dates. Buy her nice stuff. Be sweet to her. I mean, just woo her back. And then God says to him, and change the name of your kids to this one is mine. This one is beautiful. This is a victory. Change them. Why? God is showing all of Israel, the very people you despise and look way down on. Those are prostitutes down there. Those are drug addicts down there. Those are people of a different church down there are people that God loves so much, he wants you to go get them, but don't force them. Don't yell at them. Don't be mean to them. Woo them with love because that's what God is doing to all of us. No force, just love. Even then, love trumped law. Though most readers of the Bible don't see it, because we're continually told that God is, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and it is our guidebook, our law book, and our, our, our manual for everything from raising kids to how we deal with money to the words that we use and how we do church. No wonder then that we seem to be so ignorant of the Old Testament because the more we know the Old Testament, the less we're going to be able to hold on to those rigid ideas we've got. Because the Old Testament is an argument about God that's right in the open. You can see it right there. And Jesus settles the argument. But think about, you know, to borrow a phrase from Douglas Adams, think about the life, about um, life, the universe, and everything. Knowing this about God changes the way we look at all of that. We don't have a cold book of laws, but rather we have a narrative that we're invited to enter. We get to shape the story. And the greatest tool we have is love. Love allied with faith and hope can even make a Moabite woman go from being scorned and forbidden from ever being a friend to any of us or allowed in our assemblies to become an important, vital part of the lineage of Jesus the Christ. Love does that. And God is love. Our story is not locked in stone. It lives in a person. The word of God is Jesus himself. And as his community, we treasure our story. And we learn humility from reading how we got things wrong, but we're brought closer to God's heart through his love and patience. Need another example? Okay, let's do one that makes us squirm. When Moses came down from the mountain, he was carrying far more than 10 commandments on the tablets of stone. We're told that God gave him the law up there, and the law was a big, long, complicated thing. So part of that law we find in Exodus 21, where we see God legislating slavery and how it is to be managed. Exodus 21. If you bought a Hebrew slave, this is before they were known as Israel, before they were known as Israelites, and, and Jews was used quite a bit. Hebrew was perhaps more common at this time. If you bought a Hebrew slave, he was only yours for six years, then you had to set him free. For you say, that's, that's not too bad. He's a slave. And there were economic reasons why somebody would go into slavery and then be able to come out. I get all of that as well. But read down to verses 4 and 7. If you ever bought a female slave, Hebrew, you were never allowed to let her go free, ever. 
That's harder to explain. Oh, it gets worse. Three women are described in Exodus. The first was married to the male slave. The second was too. Yes, polygamy. It's all through the Old Testament. It's all through the Old Testament that it, the community story says God told him to marry more than one woman. But the second woman was given to the man after he became a slave. So the man is married. He becomes a slave. The woman is therefore enslaved too. She can't leave him. But while he is a slave, he marries another woman. The first woman was given to him. I, I, I got to get this straight. I'm going to look down at my notes to make sure I get it right. The first woman could go free when the man went free. But the second wife, he had to leave her behind. If he opted to leave slavery, he had to leave her behind. And there was a third woman I told you about. Yeah, that is if a man has a daughter and he sells her into slavery. If the father sells the daughter into slavery, she was never, ever allowed to go free, period. Think about that for a minute. Those are rules that we are told God gave us, but does that sound like Jesus? I'm aware there were other realities present in that day and age. I've done Monday morning messages on slavery. You can go to our Safe Harbor Church uh, on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, like, and hit the bell. And then go down, not at the top search bar, but at the lower search bar, and type in slavery, and they'll all come up. And I'll bring up all of those other th factors that were at play. But does it still sound good to you that God is legislating slavery to the point where when women got in, they couldn't get out? Oh, but hang on, hold that thought. Because by the time we get to Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12, the law had changed. How did it change? When did it change? We don't know, but it had changed. There, both male and female were to be freed after six years if... They were Hebrews. Any Jew Jewish person could sell themselves into slavery and know that they'd be free in six years. It's still tough, but it's much, much kinder and more humane than the law in Exodus. So why did it change? I believe it's because God is at work softening our heart and moving us away from what we think God wants, order, predictability, to what he really wants, love fellowship. God's voice can be heard in the Old Testament when he says more than once, do not treat them, speaking about slaves, as you were treated in Egypt. You can hear his love breaking through even when the laws are coming down saying, let's back off of this. Don't treat people in this way. So is it all sweetness and light? Nope, not at all. Read the books and you'll see that in that law that they claim had come down from Sinai, you could beat a slave as long as, and as hard as you wanted to. If they recovered, you're guilty of no crime at all. But if you beat them so bad they could not reco recover, there were some fines. It's not pretty. Fast forward to Jesus, you see everything change. The story has progressed now that God is with us in the flesh. And now a slave is called our brother or our sister, and the Apostle Paul would write orders that slaves were to no longer be treated as slaves, but rather as brothers, as sisters, as family. In Galatians 3, verse 28, he famously says the categories have been erased. There is now no more male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's go farther. Mark chapter 2 is where we're going to head. Jesus never said, well, the law is the law. He never said that. He never called for its strict enforcement. And a couple of times he even said, well, Moses said, and let it just hang there for people to get very uncomfortable in the room because it was so strict and so violent what Moses had said. And then Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 27 one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? 
He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, he didn't say the law is the law. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What would love require is what we ask, not what does the law require. A very famous series of uh, YouTube videos was very, very popular. I don't know if they're even still making any, but they're still out there. About a judge in Providence, Rhode Island, mainly traffic and, and little fines like that. I believe that this is probably done at extrajudicial. In other words, that the, the city said, if you go to that court and you do what that court says, it's all right. You know, kind of like some of these other judge shows. But the reason they were so, so popular was because the judge tried to be very fair, but he allowed love to override the law as much as absolutely possible. And they were a delight to watch. Our God is a delight to watch because he lets love rule. Why was David allowed to eat the bread? That if you eat that bread, oh no, you can't eat that bread. It's consecrated for the priest alone. You could be killed for touching that bread. But Jesus didn't, didn't say anything other than he was hungry. So he ate the bread and shared it with his companions. That was enough for Jesus to lay aside the law. He was hungry. This is why once you start looking for it, it's easy to see that the Bible is not a book of law. It's a book of love. It's a story of God and man interacting, wrestling, learning how to walk with each other again after the fall in the garden. And God even calls his chosen people Israel, a word which means those who wrestle with God. And it wasn't meant to be anything other than an endearing, loving compliment. This is why we find arguments in the Bible. Let's talk about a major argument between two books. By the way, we can do this with a lot of books. But I'm choosing two today because I think you'll be able to see it a lot faster. Deuteronomy on one corner. And in the other corner, we're going to have the book of Job. There's an open argument between the two books. The book of Deuteronomy is basically one long sermon said to have been delivered by Moses. More on that another day. In it, he offers a vision of a perfectly moral universe governed by God. All of creation bears witness to the wisdom and justice of God. Keep God's commands and you, your society, your world will thrive and be blessed. Disobey his laws and everything goes to hell, literally. Do good, be good, you'll be blessed. Do bad, you'll be cursed. Simple. That's the entire argument of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses calls out more than once, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cures. Choose life so that your descendants will live. Wow, that sounds understandable. Very transactional. We can get behind that. And then you read the book of Job. And God singles out Job for curses because of his righteousness. Contrary to everything we were told in Deuteronomy. Job's righteousness singles him out not for blessing, but for destruction. His life is destroyed. Loss of his family. Loss of his status. Loss of his reputation. Loss of his wealth. Loss of his, his body's integrity. Why? Because Job's righteousness, his exceptional goodness, have made him a target for suffering and God allowed it. In Deuteronomy, people never suffer unless they deserve it. In Job, there's a suffering servant who did nothing to deserve it except to draw attention in heaven. When God finally breaks into the book, he attacks Job's friends saying, quote, 
they did not speak correctly about me as my servant Job has. The one who argued with God was speaking correctly. The ones who defended God were not. You want to sit and deal with that one for a while? I've been working with the book of Job since I was probably 20 years old, wrestling, trying to figure this out. And I don't have all the answers right now, but I'm going to tell you this. The simplistic idea of Deuteronomy, you do good, you'll be blessed. Do bad, you'll be cursed. Done. Is blown up in Job. And God says, those people who say that, you know, you must have done something wrong or there would not have been this pain and such are not speaking for him. We can talk about Ezra and Amos. We can talk about Hosea and Ezra. We can talk about other arguments between books. But you need to understand when you hear this clash, it is because, remember last Sunday, our community story, we're telling it from different viewpoints. God is moving us, but he breaks into the story, whether we've gotten slavery in our heads and breaks us out of it as fast as he can move us along whether we get um, this sort of misogynation going or whether we get, we're, we're, we're opposed to other nations, we're opposed to women, we're opposed to, he breaks in and keeps moving us toward Jesus. We need to be, we need to be very, very, very careful when we grab a verse or a story and then we declare we are speaking for God. Maybe, but maybe you're not. If you cannot imagine Jesus saying what you just said, then you're probably not speaking for God. If you cannot imagine Jesus speaking this way, and by the way, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it on Facebook. Well, yeah, but Jesus made a whip and went in the temple with it a couple times to sort people out. Jesus never told you you could do that ever. And when he went in, he did not strike anyone. Look at the story. He was controlled. He did not lose his temper. You lose your temper. You don't sit down and make something to go in. You grab whatever you got. Also, he told the people that had the birds, take your birds and get them out of here while he drove the cattle out and he overturned the tables of the money changers because you can pick up money later. You can go get your cattle later. Birds... You can't go get later if he overthrew those. He was thinking the whole time. And he did it in a way to make a point. But he never said to any of them, you're going to hell. You're not worth saving. Even then, he kept coming back to the temple and teaching about love. That's what was their crime. Their crime was they were taking advantage of of people who just wanted to worship God, they were showing a lack of love. Do your sermons, do your books, do your actions, do the way you treat the shopkeeper, the 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 people at your school, people in traffic. Are they the actions and the words of Jesus Christ? You can always go find a community story that seems to back you up and if you don't pay attention to God changing the story and bringing us to Jesus. Look at Jesus first. What would he say? What would he do? Would he approve of it? That's our litmus test. That's our go, no go. Do not cross this line. That's our limit for everything. Our behavior, our teaching, everything. Because Jesus is the word of God. John chapter 1, as we close. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What is the word of God? Wrong question. Who is the word of God? Jesus the Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, please take time to read that later today. We are told that Jesus is the express 
image of God. He is what the Father looks like, sounds like, thinks like, and how the Father reacts to those of us, us, it's a collective pronoun, I'm in the group, the, who are trapped in sin and so far away from being truly holy and righteous people. While we struggle and wrestle with God, his love covers us. His grace covers us. And because of that, even though our righteousness is, as scripture says, as filthy rags, we can lift up our voices, we can sing to God with confidence, knowing he loves us. We may have other voices in our head that tell us we're not worthy, we're not saved, we're not forgivable, or we're not forgiven. But God has made his voice plain through Christ who says, whosoever will may come. For God so loved the world. And that means you. We'll be back for more next week. Go in peace.